Excuse me. I would like to inform our parties that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Please stand by. You're good. Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's media teleconference from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Heather Scott with NASA's Office of Communications. Teams from NASA and SpaceX just completed the flight readiness review for the launch of the agency's Crew-6 mission to the International Space Station from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. The launch is now targeting Monday, February 27th at 1.45 a.m. The mission will carry NASA astronauts Stephen Bowen and Warren Woody Hoberg, who will serve as mission commander and pilot respectively, along with UAE astronaut Sultan Al Nadi and Roscosmos cosmonaut Andre Fediev, who will serve as mission specialists. These crewmates will travel to the space station for a six month science and technology research mission. Plans also continue to return SpaceX's Crew 5 astronauts following a short handover on the space station with Crew 6. Senior representatives here to talk more about this important review are Ken Bowersox, Deputy Associate Administrator. Space Operations Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters, Steve Stitch, Manager of Commercial Crew Program, Dana Weigel, Deputy Manager, International Space Station Program, Emily Nelson, Chief Flight Director, William Gerstenmeyer, Vice President, Build and Flight Reliability at SpaceX, and Adnan al Mission Manager, UAE Astronaut Mission 2 from Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. We will begin with opening comments from our speakers and then open it up for questions. To get into the question queue, please press star one on your phone. And about an hour after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. And Ken, we'll start with you. Great, thanks Heather. Hey, it's a great day in human space flight. The Crew-5 uh, team is working hard up on the International Space Station, um, uh, preparing for the arrival of the Crew-6 uh, astronauts who will be replacing them. Um, I know they're all eager to come home and the Crew-6 astronauts are eager to get there. Um, uh, they just arrived at uh, Kennedy Space Center today um, to finish the final steps of their pre-launch preparations. Um, the FRR is one more step towards launch of Crew-6 and return of, of Crew-5. 
Um, it's the culmination of hundreds of hours of meetings um, throughout NASA and SpaceX uh, and our international partners uh, to prepare us for the launch. Um, uh, then we bring uh, a team of senior managers in uh, to hear a summary of that work, some of the, the biggest issues, um, and then uh, we conduct a poll. At the readiness poll, everybody was go today, uh, pending uh, some open work that Steve will talk about in more detail. Um, but as I said, the FRR is just one step towards the launch. We, we still have a lot of uh, extra work to go. We're going to maintain our focus on safety, uh, and we're going to make sure that we're ready when we launch uh, and when we bring Crew-5 home. Um, Steve? Thanks, Ken, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining this evening. Um, you know, it was really cool to have the, the crew here now in Florida. They kicked off the FRR this morning. You could tell they are in good spirits. Um, Steve told us that they were ready to go, and when we were ready to go, he'll be ready to go fly. I just want to thank the entire uh, NASA and SpaceX team for all the hard work that they've done getting to this point. You know, the FRR is the, the final, at the agency level, it's the final review, but there's many, 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 many hours of analysis work, inspections, and so forth to get here. Um, at the FRR, at the conclusion today, uh, we did adjust the launch time to uh, one day later than planned, it'll be February 27th, uh, Monday at 1.45 a.m. When we looked at the work remaining to go primarily um, on the vehicle, uh, getting uh, Dragon and Falcon 9 ready to go, we were a little bit behind on that work, and so we need a little bit more time to do that. Uh, overall schedule, the vehicle will roll out to the pad uh, tomorrow, um, and then we'll uh, do a, a dry dress and static fire uh, likely on, uh, on Friday early in the morning around 1.45 a.m. would be the, the targeted T0 time for the dry dress and then static fire would be about 5.45 a.m. Uh, on Friday. Um, you know, a lot of great work by the team. We talked about a few special topics today. Uh, we ended up replacing a, a throttle valve about uh, a month ago, right around the beginning of the year. This is a, a valve used for the Super Draco, so we talked through that and the flight rationale. We've loaded propellant on Dragon, and, and that system is good and tight and ready to go fly. Uh, we talked about uh, on the Dracos, inside the Dracos, uh, we'd observed some spotting inside the, the Draco dome, and the Draco dome is made of titanium, so we wanted to take some extra precaution there just to make sure we understood that and that there was no uh, risk for uh, combustion in that area, and, and we did that and cleared that at the Program Control Board and talked that at the FRR today. Uh, during uh, the last flight, uh, crewed flight on Crew 5, we had a, a, a misalignment on the engines, uh, the thrust vector control units for each of the engines. We saw a slight out of family roll rate, and so we had worked through that and, and cleared that for flight, and we talked that as one of the, uh, one of the special topics today. Uh, we are working through a couple of items that we have to clear uh, prior to uh, uh, moving forward for flight, and we'll do that uh, later this week at the Program Control Board. Uh, one of those has to do with uh, the, the pod panels. These are the, the panels that cover the exterior of the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, we have a little additional analysis to do uh, relative to understanding the thermal performance of those uh, pod panels. That will come through in the next couple of days. Uh, it should close out Thursday at the, at the Program Control Board. Um, on the Composite overwrap pressure vessels, these are uh, bottles of helium that are in the liquid oxygen tank on the Falcon 9. Uh, we have noticed that there was some uh, blending done in some areas on the, on the liner, and we have some testing and analysis to go make sure that those are good for flight, and we'll clear that this week as well. And then finally, we continue to analyze the fleet data uh, for all the flights that SpaceX flies, including Starlink. There was a recent Starlink flight where there was a, a little bit of evidence of uh, some combustion in one of the uh, engine bays that we've got to go work through. Uh, we're actually inspecting that booster, SpaceX is. Uh, it's at the hangar here, and we're going to inspect that and try to make sure that there's clearance from our flight. It was a 12 flight booster, and so we're flying a first flight booster uh, on Crew 6, and so we've got to go get through that work. Um, you know, it's really exciting to be here. It's always great to get into the launch countdown. You can tell people are ready to go. We're taking our time each step of the way, uh, getting Dragon ready to go, doing the proper analysis, getting Falcon 9 ready to go, and making sure we'll go fly when we're ready. And with that, I will turn it over to Dana Wild from the ISS program.
Thanks, Steve. And thank you all for being here uh, and joining us today. Um, as you've heard, we had a really good thorough review today from a station standpoint. We aren't working any major issues, so we're ready to go. Still got a few reviews in front of us, including our international mission management team final readiness review, but uh, everything's looking good on board the vehicle. We're excited to welcome Crew 6 on board. They'll be there for about six months. They'll have a really busy increment supporting numerous vehicles that will come and go, and they'll have more than uh, 20, 200 science experiments and technology demonstrations that they'll be supporting. Um, they've got a wide range of research objectives, including investigations aimed at furthering capabilities that we will need for going beyond low Earth orbit. So those are things that we're looking at for either going to Moon or beyond to Mars. Uh, they'll also be studying how certain materials burn in microgravity with one of our new facilities that studies combustion of solid materials on board. And they'll be examining tissue chip research on heart, brain, and cartilage functions, along with a number of other experiments. Let's see, on board this past weekend, we had the 82P Progress Russian cargo vehicle undock from the MRM2 port. Uh, during the departure of the progress, we took some imagery of the radiator, which is the region where a progress coolant leak was seen on February 11th. The Russians are continuing to take a really close look at both the Soyuz and the progress coolant leaks. They formed a state commission that is assessing uh, the anomaly. They're looking at everything from ground launch through, through on orbit in terms of causal factors to, to try to understand that. They uh, have taken a look at the upcoming Soyuz that's uh, slated to, to launch, and they're not seeing any issues with the, the vehicle, so they're pressing ahead with their launch preparations and their launch campaign. The, uh, the progress that departed frees up the port for that uncrewed Soyuz that is planned to launch this Thursday evening with the docking Saturday evening. Shortly after that, uh, crew 6 will arrive. Crew 6 and Crew 5 will have a standard handover, which is about five days long, and then Crew 5 will come home. And then right after that, we kind of get into a busy vehicle cadence through the rest of the, the spring and heading into early summer. In mid-March, we've got SpaceX 27's cargo mission, followed by Northrop Grumman 19. And then we've got the Boeing CFT short duration mission, and then a second private astronaut mission, the Axiom 2 mission. It's a very, very busy time around the corner for us. We're excited to have the crew on board. This will be our second SpaceX integrated crew mission with a cosmonaut flying on the Dragon and our first long duration mission with a UAE crew member. And with that, I'll pass it to Emily Nelson. Thank you, Dana. We are... Uh you know, as, as has been mentioned, we had a really comprehensive review today and um, the culmination of a great deal of work and thoughtful examination of our readiness. As we were talking, the crew did arrive at KSC this afternoon. Uh, they are, of course, very excited to start their mission, and their arrival at KSC today is an exciting milestone on the path to launch. They are have been in quarantine for a little over a week now. They have a two-week quarantine period um, leading up to their launch, and the rest of their time here at KSC, they'll spend in the astronaut, astronaut crew quarters. They do have one more significant milestone, um, a day of launch rehearsal that we call dry dress. That'll be Friday night where we uh, get them suited up and into the spacecraft and are basically a step-by-step -step practice of all of the steps they're going to do as we um, get ready for launch on launch day. And then following that, they'll spend some time with their families um, before they depart for their six-month stay. The crew on board is doing an exceptional job and is eager for their crewmates to arrive and begin the handover process. Um, we've, we're really excited to have all of these crew members headed into space. The, the crew and our flight ops team are ready to support, and we are looking forward to launch uh, next week. And with that, I'll hand over to Bill Gerstenmeyer. Thank you. This is our <clears throat> first human uh, spaceflight mission of 2023 and really kicks off a pretty exciting year for Dragon. 
you know, Crew-6 is SpaceX's eighth uh, human spaceflight mission to the International Space Station, and overall it's our 34th uh, Dragon mission to the orbiting laboratory. That includes 26 cargo missions. It's the first launch for this uh, Falcon 9 booster, and it's the fourth flight of a Dragon spacecraft for a human spaceflight mission. This Dragon previously flew on Demo-2, Crew-2, Axiom-1 to the space station. Again, human spaceflight is, is really humbling and difficult. I think the review we went through today was extremely thorough. We went through all the data. We went through all the past uh, Falcon flights, looked at all the data to make sure there wasn't anything we learned there that, that we want to take into this flight to make sure we're really ready to go fly. We still got a little bit of work, as Steve described, to go ahead and take a look at some of the hardware that came back. Again, it's great to get our hardware back. We've got the vehicle over in the, in the hangar. We're taking a look at some of the stuff we saw in the last Starlink flight. I don't think any those things will be a concern for the crew flight, but we don't take things for granted. We want to make sure they're really ready. Um, again, I want to thank uh, everyone that's participating in this. It was uh, good to be here today, and now I'll turn it over to UAE and uh, for any opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our colleagues at NASA, SpaceX, and the old team members on achieving this important uh, milestone, the flight readiness review, which makes us a step closer to the launch of the Crew-6. As you all know, this is the UAE's second uh, human space flight mission, second astronaut mission, and the first long-duration mission. We're very proud and honored uh, to be part of this uh, long-duration mission. Uh, sending Sultan Niadi for the first time uh, has been doing the training and preparing for this mission for over five years. Uh, and this mission, we have uh, 19 different experiments that will be conducted by Sultan, the areas related to the life sciences, uh, material sciences, and technology demonstration, preparing our scientific community, our researchers, and students uh, to be part of the mission, supporting the, the experiments uh, in different capacities and different levels. We have a lot of education outreach activities as well uh, through this, uh, in this mission, as well as, uh, as the EPO uh, events. From our end, uh, we are on the final uh, stage of preparation uh, of all of that, uh, supporting uh, the mission. We're also preparing our mission control center, our operation center, to support the mission from Dubai. Uh, we have a team uh, based there that will be following all the activities uh, with Sultan and will be uh, supporting the mission and in contact with the mission control centers in, in Houston and other uh, places. Also, we have a team that will be based here in, uh, in Houston uh, to coordinate and liaise also with the, uh, our team based uh, in Dubai. Again, uh, congratulations on achieving this important uh, milestone and uh, looking forward for the launch. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll now move into the portion of that we will take questions. If you'd like to enter the queue, please press star one. As a reminder to ensure as many people as possible get the opportunity to ask their questions, please ask only one question per person. Do state your name, affiliation, and to whom you are directing your question. And our first question tonight comes from Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Eric, the line is yours. Hi, thanks very much for taking my call. I guess this question is for Dana. Uh, today, Roscosmos came out and said that the the progress vehicle on station was damaged by an external impact. That makes two external impacts in two months in the same place on Russian vehicles. I'm just wondering, you know, what's NASA's assessment of that imagery? And, you know, do you find that credible? And if so, you know, should we be concerned about MMOD damage all over the station? Thank you. Um, we just gave them the imagery this weekend, so our teams are looking at it in parallel. So we took a lot of that imagery. We were mostly focused on trying to understand where the fluid was. So we've also seen some of their summaries about um, their assessment, but we haven't had a chance to really talk with them. I actually don't interpret that as micrometeoroid damage over the spacecraft. I think what they're really trying to understand is are there any signs or signatures that somewhere along the spacecraft's journey, where whether it's, it's launch or launch vehicle separation, there's some other external influence or damage that could have occurred that could have been a factor there. So I don't, we'll, we'll talk to them, but I don't actually think they, they meant that statement to mean that there was a lot of micrometeoroid. We certainly did not see uh, that type of, of indication, but that's still 
part of the forward work that we've got to do in, in helping to review the imagery. Our next question is from Jeff Faust of Space News. Hey, good afternoon. Um, now that you have a, a one-day slip in the launch, just curious what the backup launch opportunities are, um, and if you also have any um, early look at the weather for an early Monday launch. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can take that. This is Steve Stitch. Uh, we do have a backup opportunity uh, on February 28th at uh, 1.22 a.m., and then the, the next day would not be a good opportunity just from a rendezvous phasing perspective. March 1st wouldn't be good. And then we'll pick back up with a sequence of three in a row um, starting on March the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Uh, we're looking at weather a little bit. It's pretty early, I would say, to, to look at the weather. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, I suspect we'll have some challenges uh, with the abort weather. Uh, regime and, and up the coast a little bit, being this time of year, we'll have to watch um, lows and frontal systems and so forth. So, But we'll start looking at that uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. Our next question is from Bill Harwood, CBS News. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I think this is for Dana Weigel. Um, if, if the MS-23 vehicle fails to dock as planned, what is the fallback plan in terms of how many times can they back off and then reattempt to dock over what time period? In other words, I, I, I'm assuming they could back off and try 24 hours later, but I know there must be a limit to that. And, and while I realize the odds of them not being able to dock the vehicle are, are extraordinarily remote, uh, what is the fallback plan if that happens? I mean, I'm assuming it's an extension of the, the plan currently in place, but if you could talk about that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Sure. Um, you are right. They do have capability to do what we call either station keeping or to re-rendezvous. They can, they can break out and they can come back and they've got a handful of different attempts. It really depends on when they do it and how much um, propellant they use. So they look at their consumables. You know, they've flown uh, an uncrewed Soyuz before. And as I think you're probably aware, it's very similar to flying the, the automated progress vehicles they've got an awful lot of experience, um, <clears throat> but again, they could break out and they could re-rendezvous if they needed. Um, to answer your other question about what would we do if something happened to the spacecraft, you're right, we'd stay in the configuration we're in right now. Everybody's got a contingency ride home and we'd go regroup together and go look at um, next plans and next options. Got a lot of crewed vehicles around the corner between the Soyuz being prepared for the, the fall mission, between the Axiom vehicle, we got the Boeing CFT vehicle. So there's a lot of just uh, spacecraft in flow and in process. And so we'd go step back and take a look at what assets we have and what the best overall plan was for the entire crew. And again, to enter the queue, please press star one on your phone. The next question is from Marvin Marshall, Nighttime News. Hi, my name is Marvin Marshall from the Nighttime News Space Report. Um, now, I was curious, what is one of the most important changes that you guys have made to the crew activity plan between Crew 1 and now Crew 6 that has helped streamline sending astronauts to the station? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, so. Uh, in between, I, I would say between um, Demo 2, our, our first uh, uncrewed demonstration mission, Crew 1, and now, I think the difference has been, um, you know, the Demo 1, Demo 2 crew and Crew 1 were intimately involved with the development of, of, of Dragon, and now we're into a little bit better rhythm, I would say, on uh, the training flows uh, for Dragon. Um, the crew timelines uh, are probably a little bit more standard now. Uh, all the stowage is a little bit more standard. The preparation is a little bit more standard. Um, we're a little bit uh, gotten in a better rhythm of developing the and, and designing the suits and, and getting those suited for every single crew member that goes to fly. Each, each suit that SpaceX builds is a custom suit. Uh, fits each crew member specifically. I think that that's going quite a bit better. Um, our management on board of, of the cargo and how we handle the cargo is, is improved. 
the vehicle itself, we've made a couple improvements on board that the crew uh, would, would benefit from. Um, some of the uh, compartments that things are stored on, we've got some improved fasteners on those. We've had a couple of issues in previous flights with, with those fasteners. And then um, for the ta they've got a new tablet, and that tablet has uh, the ability to be charged via USB port, just like you would uh, at your house, uh, plug it in to either your laptop or, or the wall. So those are some of the things that come to mind. Our next question comes from Ken Kramer with Space Up Close. Hi, thank you for doing this. Very exciting day to see the crew arrive today. Uh, my question is for Bill Gerstenmeier. Um, as a result of these, uh, the micrometeoroid impacts and, and everything else, uh, have you decided to, to do any upgrades to the Dragon to, to increase its protection? And I'm wondering if any inspections have been done of the Crew 5 Dragon to make sure it hasn't suffered any damage. Thank you. Yeah, we, we typically uh, do an inspection of the Dragon vehicle and take a look and make sure everything is okay, and that was just done recently, and it all checked out fine. It looks good on orbit. Um, we had, that used to be kind of a nice to have. We now made that an official flight rule, so it actually will get done every time and reviewed and make sure we actually go do that. Um, one good thing is we have, in the case of Dragon, we have two radiator loops for what it's worth. So there's there's two of them. There's redundant pumps, redundancy, and some some uh, some redundancy in that area. Again, I think we we take MMOD stuff seriously. We'll continue to watch the vehicle. We get the vehicle back every time. We have the NASA team come actually go do a detailed inspection of the vehicle. So we actually record all the dings and all the the indications. We've done testing where we've actually fired particles into the thruster chambers and actually dinged the thruster chambers and put MMOD holes in the thruster chambers and show that they're still good and they still operate and they don't create any damage to the vehicle. Again, I think it's always been our number one risk uh, throughout my career as MMOD has been, been number one on the list. I think we treat it seriously. We'll go look again and see if this gives us an opportunity to find some other areas we might be able to improve on the vehicle. But right now, I think we're in, we're in pretty good shape overall. And the good thing is having the dissimilar redundancy of the different vehicles gives us a lot of flexibility, as Dana talked about earlier. That that's a really good posture to be in, where you're not dependent upon any one vehicle. You've got abilities to kind of mix and match vehicles, and that's that's healthy for all of us. Our next question is from David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Thanks very much. Uh, two questions, uh, Dana or Emily, can you talk about what the what Houston slash NASA saw in the imagery of the uh, Progress 82 as it was leaving space station and what you saw? And Gers, can you talk a little bit about DM2 capsule going back up into space? Thank you. Let's see, um, the, the imagery was mostly focused on trying to identify the location of the leak. Um, what we saw was um, <clears throat> a large kind of shadowed looking section that had the fluid still kind of attached to the vehicle. It's very viscous coolant in the progress. So it hadn't yet sublimated, so you could actually kind of see a shadowed and glossy area. We could tell that it looked like it had shifted a little bit as it moved. Um, we could also see kind of a, a darker, um, what might have been the origin kind of hole uh, where the, the coolant was coming from. At least that was our, you know, observation of what it looked like. Of course, the, the Russians have more expertise, and uh, we'll have to determine if, if it makes sense based on the data that they saw, if that is indeed the leak location. Other than that, we took a lot of general images of the outside of the spacecraft, I'm looking at other features, solar rays, general radiator panels, just the overall condition of the spacecraft. And just one additional note, the the first indications we always get is is the appearance of what looks like snow coming from some portion of the space station, which will get someone's attention. Either a cosmonaut or an astronaut will call us and say, hey, we're seeing white flakes. And that's the point at which we'll start directing the cameras and, and getting all of this imagery. So that those first indications are, are just unusual flakes of snow floating, floating away from the space station in space. 
think there's a tremendous advantage of getting a chance to reuse a vehicle and take a look at all the hardware and actually go in and inspect some of the areas. You know, we do a lot of um, developmental work where we do acceptance testing where we make sure the vehicle is assembled correctly and built together correctly. And then we also do a lot of qualification testing. But I think sometimes a full-up integrated test and actually taking the vehicle to space actually lets you look at systems in an integrated fashion as long as you're not taking life out of the vehicle and really gives you a chance to see how systems operate, how they work in a microgravity environment, how they interact with each other. And getting a chance to fly this Dragon for the fourth time gives us a lot of insight and a lot of confidence that this vehicle is really ready to go fly. And we fully checked out all the components. They're all ready to go. We're, we're, I think the vehicle's made it. We'll roll out tomorrow. Again, we'll get a chance to go through dry dress with the crew, get a chance to see the life support systems work, see the suits work, make sure all the electronic systems work. But again, I think the fact that you get a chance to see reuse and get a chance to see the vehicle again is a tremendous asset and, and helps you ultimately fly safe. Again, to ask a question, press star one to enter the queue, and we'll go next to Bill Harwood with CBS. Bill, are you there? Sorry, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. This was for Gersten Mar. I was just a uh, Gerst, I was just curious if you could give us a little update on Pad 40 and your preps to be able to launch crew and cargo uh, from the air, from the Space Force Station. Thanks. Yeah, we're in the process of modifying Pad 40. Um, I think we've. We've uh, removed some of the water suppression systems or relocated them. I think we're starting to put the tower in place. We're starting to lay in some of that that early work to get ready to go support crew off of Pad 40. Uh, by probably, I think, the third quarter of this year, we should be ready to go fly crew off of Pad 40. We'll fly, probably fly cargo first, and then we'll go we'll go fly crew. So, again, that, that progress is, is moving well and moving forward. Again, I think in the spirit of redundancy, it's nice having the two launch pads for crew and cargo. And from my perspective, it's nice that we've broken ground out there. They've started to put the pilings in, and we're in the middle of uh, uh, working with SpaceX NASA. Is a series of critical design reviews on the on the on the launch tower, uh, the ax crew access arm, and all those systems. So it's pretty exciting. We should see that by the end of the year. Okay, that's going to wrap things up here for us tonight for the Crew-6 mission update. Continue to follow along with NASA's coverage both on NASA TV and our social media channels. For additional information, schedules, and links to streaming video, please visit nasa.gov live. Thank you again for joining us, and have a good weekend.